A look at the Chungkwano Lamtin Tunnel and the Cross Bay Link projects. Conflicting reports on whether Hong Kong submitted a national anthem recording to the organizer of a rugby match in South Korea. And G20 summit talks get underway in Bali. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The city's $20 billion Chungkwano Lam Tin Tunnel and the Cross Bay Link and Chungkwano projects are set to operate on December 11th. The authorities expect some car users will use the new tunnel so that the traffic congestion problems in the region will be alleviated. Christy Khan has more. The construction of the Chungkwano Old Lam Tin Tunnel has entered its final stage. The Lamtin entrance of the new tunnel can be accessed from the Eastern Harbour Crossing as well as Chakwaling Road. The project adopts a design of a 3.8-kilometer dual two-lane highway, of which around 2.2 kilometers are in the form of tunnel. Starting December 11th, drivers can drive to Zhengguano via the new routes. In a press briefing today, the authorities expect a new tunnel to alleviate the heavy traffic problems at Shenguano Tunnel. Uh, under our estimate, it's about 30 to 40 percent of the original car user uh, of the Shenguano Tunnel will be diverted to the new tunnel. It all depends on the actual site, actual traffic situation and their destination. So we will closely monitor the utilization of each tunnel during the first period of the opening of the tunnel. Separately, the Cross Bay Link in Chengguano will open to traffic on the 11th of next month as well. The 1.8-kilometer Cross Bay Link connects the Chengguano Tunnel with Wangpo Road adjacent to Aloha's Park. This is also the first marine viaduct in the city comprising carriageways, a cycle track and a footway. The officials said the two projects will help reduce the traveling time between Songguan'ou and Kowloon East by up to 20 minutes during the morning peak hours. The authorities added that bus operators are expected to open new bus routes to use the new tunnel. Christy Khan, TVB News. Meantime, different versions are emerging tonight as to what happened before the national anthem saga at Sunday's Asia Rugby Sevens match in South Korea. While the Korean Rugby Union reportedly did not receive a recording of the national anthem from Hong Kong, others in charge have said otherwise. Sharon Tang has more. A song associated with the 2019 social unrest was played instead of the Chinese national anthem at a rugby match involving the city's team in Incheon last Sunday. According to the Korea Times, a public relations representative from the Korean Rugby Union had asked each team to submit its national anthem but failed to get one from the Hong Kong team. The person added that a staff saved the Hong Kong national anthem listed at the top of an internet search in a file folder. This evening, Asia Rugby set the record straight. Any staff member cannot just download a, a, a version of a national anthem and then let it be played. At around the same time, the Hong Kong Rugby Union released a statement saying that for the past 25 years, Hong Kong has been using the Chinese national anthem in each tournament. But it was never informed by Asia Rugby that the host intended to play a national anthem downloaded from the internet. The union added that if a similar incident happens in future, Hong Kong will immediately withdraw from the tournament. Chief Executive John Lee reiterated today that the incident is unacceptable. Uh, so I will be uh, asking uh, CSTB uh, to look into this matter together with the um, sporting community and the organizations so as to find a way to ensure that uh, improvement can be made in this area. The police will investigate along the lines of any violation against the National Anthem Ordinance and the Hong Kong National Security Law. Asia Rugby said Hong Kong police have so far not been in touch with them. Sharon Tang, TVB News. Chief Executive John Lee today said the administration would no longer label their anti-COVID policies as zero plus something, adding they would further ease restrictions if there's room to do so. 
since implementing the Zero Plus Three scheme, which ended mandatory hotel quarantine in late September, the city has not experienced a COVID rebound. Today, Hong Kong reported 5,951 new COVID cases, 520 of which were imported. Given that the city's pandemic situation has stabilized, different sectors of society have called on the government to scrap the Amber Code system. However, authorities say the system will remain in place. The city's chief executive today said authorities will have targeted arrangements for mega events and activities of economic importance while managing risks. Lee added that Hong Kong had a responsibility to avoid adding risks to the mainland's pandemic control measures. There is much discussion about zero plus zero and zero plus three. Now, what does zero plus zero mean? It means something different to different people. As long as we keep COVID risks manageable, we try to minimize the restrictions as much as possible. That position is clear. In Indonesia, President Joko Widodo today welcomed leaders of the group of 20 top economies in Bali at the start of a two-day summit. The talks began with a hopeful theme of recover together, recover stronger, after the economic consequences of COVID-19. But talks soon turned to Ukraine and Russia. Tracy Furness has more. Arriving at the summit were members of the G20 nations that comprise industrialized and developing nations, accounting for 80% of the world's economic activity and two-thirds of the world's population. All leaders are expected to attend, but missing this year was Russian President Vladimir Putin, who sent his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. The summit's official focus is financial stability, health, sustainable energy and digital transformation. But tensions over Russia's invasion of Ukraine complicated efforts to tackle those topics. Russia's war impacts us all, no matter where we live, from Europe to Africa or the Middle East. And the single best way to end the acute crisis in food and energy is for Russia to end the senseless war and to respect the UN Charter. The Kremlin has decided to weaponize food, driving up hunger, poverty and instability. Earlier in his opening speech, Indonesia's President Joko Widodo said there were no other options but to end the war. If the war does not end, it will be difficult for the world to move forward. If the war does not end, it will be difficult for us to take responsibility for the future of current generation and future generations. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky told the G2 leaders Tuesday that now was the time to stop Russia's war in his country. Speaking via video link, Zelensky proposed a 10-point peace plan to end the war justly and on the basis of the UN Charter and international law. He called for a complete withdrawal of Russian troops and full Ukrainian control of its territory. He also suggested an international conference to cement the key elements of the post-war security architecture in the Euro-Atlantic space, including guarantees for Ukraine. The Ukraine president referred to the summit as the G19, apparently as he does not consider Russia to be part of it. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen said today he has COVID-19 and is leaving the group of, of 20 meetings in Bali. The diagnosis comes just days after he hosted world leaders at the ASEAN summit in Phnom Penh. The Cambodian leader said in a social media post that he tested positive for the coronavirus Monday night and an Indonesian physician confirmed the diagnosis this morning. Hun Sen said he felt normal and had no idea when he might have become infected. He has canceled his scheduled meetings at the G20 and upcoming APEC Economic Forum in Bangkok to return home. During the ASEAN summit in Cambodia, Hun Sen met and shook hands with many leaders, including U.S. President Joe Biden. The White House said Biden tested negative this morning. 
China and the U.S. agreed to examine areas of potential cooperation following President Xi Jinping's talks with U.S. President Joe Biden ahead of the G20 summit in Bali. President Xi subsequently held discussions with French President Emmanuel Macron, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, and South Korean President Yoon suk Yeol at the, as the summit officially got underway today. Daniel Rao tells us more. President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden held three hours of talks on Monday evening ahead of the start of the G20 summit in Bali today. The meeting, which marked Biden's first face-to-face -face dialogue with President Xi since he took up office, came amid growing economic and security tensions between the two superpowers. Taiwan was high on the agenda. President Xi stressed that the Taiwan question is at the very core of China's core interests, the bedrock of the political foundation of China-U.S. relations and the first red line that must not be crossed in China-U.S. relations. Biden reiterated U.S. support for its long-standing one-China policy. Although there was no major diplomatic breakthrough, the White House said Biden and Xi agreed to empower key senior officials to work on areas of potential cooperation. President Xi met with French President Emmanuel Macron this morning, with the war in Ukraine and business matters proving prevalent. On the economic front, President Xi stated he hopes France will provide Chinese businesses there with a fairer, more equitable and non-discriminatory business environment. He said the two countries should expand two-way trade and investment and uphold international economic and trade rules and order. On the war in Ukraine, President Xi told Macron that China stands for a ceasefire, a cessation of the conflict and peace talks. The two leaders reaffirmed their position on preventing the use of nuclear arms in the war in Ukraine. President Xi later held talks with Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in the first meeting between leaders of China and Australia since 2016. Albanese said trade as well as consular and human rights issues were discussed. He said the talks were another important step towards the stabilization of the Australia-China relationship. Relations between Beijing and Canberra took a turn for the worse in 2017, when Australia introduced laws to deal with what it called Chinese interference in Australian politics. Beijing was also angered by Canberra's 2018 decision to ban Huawei from its 5G network on national security grounds, a decision followed by other Western nations. Still, Australia did not commit to any pledges to normalize trade relations with China following the G20 dialogue. After Albanese, President Xi held his first face-to-face -face talks with South Korean President Yoon suk Yeol. President Xi said that China will deepen cooperation with South Korea on areas including high-tech manufacturing and speed up talks on a bilateral trade agreement. Yoon expressed hopes for greater cooperation in addressing North Korea's nuclear and missile development and to tackle regional and global issues. Daniel TVB News. Still ahead, the UN General Assembly passes a resolution calling for Russia to pay reparations to Ukraine. Consumer Council test results for fish oil supplements. And the annual Christmas Island red crab migration. Welcome back to TVB News. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today appealed to leaders at the Group of 20 summit in Indonesia to take further steps to press for an end to Russia's war on Ukraine. Zelensky reaffirmed 10 conditions for ending the conflict, including the complete withdrawal of Russian troops and Ukraine taking back full control of its territory. His appeal came after the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution calling for Russia to pay reparations to Ukraine over its February invasion. Nazvi Karim reports. The proposal in front of you today is a proclamation that Russia must be held accountable for its violations of international law in Ukraine. As Ukraine's armed forces continue to claim gains in the east and south, Kyiv's diplomatic battles thousands of miles away are also enjoying a measure of success. In New York, the United Nations General Assembly approved a resolution, though not overwhelmingly, calling for Russia to be held accountable for its invasion of Ukraine and make reparations to Kyiv. The resolution was supported by 94 of the Assembly's 193 members, with 14 against and 73 abstaining. 
It was the lowest level of support so far from five Ukraine-related resolutions adopted by the General Assembly since Russia's invasion in February. Countries that rejected the resolution included Russia, China and Iran. Before the vote, Russia's ambassador Vasily Nembenzia said the resolution was legally null and void and that the West was trying to worsen the conflict and use Russian money to pay for it. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Monday visited the recaptured southern provincial capital Kherson city, saying it marked a watershed moment in the war, adding that Ukraine was ready to talk peace on its own terms. Is it the beginning of the, of the end of the war? Of course, you see our strong army. We are step by step coming uh, to, our, to our country, to all the temporary occupied territories. We don't believe Russia, yes, and uh, they are tricking with all the world. That's why we are going forward. We are ready for peace, but our peace for our country is all our country, all our territory. Zelensky also welcomed comments from U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday after his meeting with President Xi Jinping in Indonesia that both countries were against the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Today, a baby born somewhere in the world will become the 8 billionth person on Earth. According to United Nations projections, the world would today have doubled its population in 48 years since hitting the 4 billion mark in 1974. India, meanwhile, is set to overtake China as the world's most populous country next year. Nigeria is among the eight countries the UN says will account for more than half of the world's population growth between now and 2050, along with Congo, Ethiopia and Tanzania, among others. Over the next three decades, the West African nation's population is expected to soar to 375 million from 216 million people now. Nigeria will have the highest population behind India, China and the United States. Other countries expected to produce sharp population increases are India, Pakistan and the Philippines. The UN report pro projects that next year, India, with a current population of 1.412 billion, will surpass China with a current population of 1.426 billion. India's population growth has, however, begun to slow down and the fertility rate has dropped, according to India's health ministry. In 2036, 600 million people will be living in urban cities in India, representing 40% of the population. Your daily dose of health supplements might not be as healthy as they seem. The Consumer Council found that all the fish oil supplements it tested contained contaminants or carcinogens. The watchdog also found vast disparities in the performances of thermoventilators. Jackie Lin with details. Among the 25 samples of fish oil supplements tested, all but one were found to contain contaminant 3-MCPD. The daily intake over the long term could impair kidney function, the central nervous and male reproductive systems. The 3-MCPD levels exceeded EU limits in these three brands, with Adrian Gagnon surpassing the cap by a whopping six times. GNC and AG's distributors said they will furnish more data to the council to corroborate their health claims. Among the 14 samples found to contain genotoxic carcinogen glycidol, AG's level again exceeded EU limits. Another genotoxic carcinogen, aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs, were detected in six samples. And pregnant women beware, this fish oil capsule marketed to pregnant women not only saw PAH levels running over EU limits, but it also contains the highest contents of dioxins. The watchdog has referred the product to the Center for Health Protection for follow-up action. We strongly believe that um, manufacturers really have the responsibility to uh, improve the product. Um, and also, for, from the regulation point of view, um, probably uh, we require more civilians to um, check um, the quality and also the safety level of these products. Meanwhile, the DHA contents in two products fell short of the label values by more than 70%. DHA is an omega-3 fatty acid helpful for maintaining heart health and blood circulation. With winter just around the corner, the Washok tested 13 thermoventilators for bathrooms. 
Two models failed to meet safety standards because their internal electrical components metal or plastic casing could be loosened accidentally. But the watchdog says such risks are not high if used properly, thanks to protection from the front cover panel. Still, some big disparities in the ventilator's close drying capability, excluding one model that failed to dry close within the set time limit of eight hours. The least energy efficient sample cost twice as much money and energy than the best performing one. If that model is used 15 times a month to dry close, the device alone set household's electricity bill back by nearly $170. Jackie Lin, TVB News. Christmas Island's red crabs have begun their annual migration with some roads closed to allow for the crustaceans to cross the Australian island safely. Footage showed thousands of the crabs crossing streets and climbing bridges. Millions emerged from the center of the island for their annual journey to the sea to spawn off the coast of Western Australia. The male crabs journey back to the jungle first as the females stay behind in the burrows for about two weeks to lay eggs. Each female crab can produce up to 100,000 eggs, which she will deposit into the ocean. That's the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.